Hey, 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 welcome to Undoing the Complex with Chantel and Dante. We are your host for this podcast. You sound like a late night radio show talk host. Well, you asked me to intro and I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> um, but without um, much of an introduction, you guys have been rolling with us for a little bit now, um, or maybe you haven't and you clicked on this podcast, but we just want to say we're so honored that you would take time out of your day to pop in some headphones and listen to us um it honestly means a lot we know that there's a responsibility in living free and whole and going after um vulnerability freedom marriage health all of that fun stuff and it's a cost but we are so encouraged by um so many of the comments and feedbacks and conversations that we've had with people that listen to our podcast and you guys are the reason we want to do it more even in the full on season of baby Chantel's pregnant and we got kids running around we got full-time jobs businesses that we're doing but right this, now they're currently watching frozen in the other room yeah we, so that we, we could record this real quick exactly and um but y'all are worth it because y'all take the time out to also listen and to glean mm-hmm. and so we really appreciate you um yeah just wanted to say that before we hop into this episode, which is part two of our um, two part, you know, conversation interview style where we are sitting with um, a group of creatives and actors um, at a school, um, a conservatory art school. And um, a lot of good things came out of that conversation. And so we just wanted to share it with you guys. There's going to be a lot more q a in this space so you'll hear their voices a little bit um but we a lot of good things came out of this we ended up after this session um people came up to us just asking different questions and um it was a special time Mm -hmm. we had a lot of fun doing it and if you guys have any follow-up questions from questions people asked we would love to hear from you and answer your questions too yes i'm gonna say this um I say it a lot, but I mean it. DM us. Um, I love but, getting DMs from y'all. Yeah, you, but do it right away because you know how you're like, man, I'm inspired or um, I'm really, I have questions now, but you're like, oh, I'll do it later. We never get to it. So do it right after this podcast. Just message us on IG. Um, if you're inspired, then um, you can also just, you know, hit that review button and um, write a little comment of how this has impacted you. It really means a lot. And it, um, the feedback, we love it. So, all right, this is part two. All right. <laughs> yep. Her brain just I stopped. I saw it. So, uh, without further ado, here it is. Part two. What would you say, Dante? You said you said you went to counseling two times a week for a year. Yes. What was the payoff for you? Yes. Yes. Look. I, I love it. I love it. Um, one of the payoffs was, um, going, going for that long, um, I got to create some new pathways and some new ways of thinking that, um, I had a weekly accountability to my word. Because counseling wasn't just me going to receive, it was also me going to make decisions. Me deciding, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show up to this, or me deciding, man, I'm gonna open up to people consistently, and having having someone weekly that I could go to, that could just share from a place of hope, (laughs) in a place of, hey, this works, you know. And here's the thing, I I meet with guys now who um, have done counseling and they're still where they're at. Counseling doesn't just fix you. Yeah. You know, there, there, unfortunately, <laughs> um, there, there is a, there's a personal responsibility. Um, I, I honestly, I feel like the best counselors ask the best questions. That's just my personal. That that you're able to think for your own life. Like I look at, I look at counseling as more empowering versus coming to just you know, lift you up again because you had a down week. Yeah. 
but more empowering that even when you have a down week, you can still show up. Yeah. Um, but but there's a season where I just I just couldn't show up, and so I went more consistently so that I could create new ways of thinking so that I could show up. Does that make sense? But I knew that that had an expiration date, and that pressure, that pressure to actually show up, it was a good thing. Wasn't wasn't a bad thing. Bless you. Um, it was a, it, it was a good thing, and so. Um, and counseling shows your blind spots. That's why I love it because you you have friends and stuff, but they know you and they filter you through how they know you. But counseling can see what you can't see. They're looking at your life from a bird's eye view, and so even for our marriage counseling, they were able to point out blind spots that we didn't see. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of times you just. You're trying to figure, you're learning you. You're, you're learning who you actually are in a real world. And counseling helps identify some of those things. And so it, it helps identify some of your tendencies um, where a lot of your um, brokenness or shame comes from or the fear of punishment or all, all of the things that stops you from showing up that causes you to put on a face in front of certain people or that, that causes you to hide when you feel certain feelings. Like it identifies, oh, where did this come from? Because if we can get to the root in a safe space, because counseling is supposed to be a safe space where we can actually get to the root. We're gonna create an environment where you feel like you can walk around and roam in your life without the pressure of the outside world. Does that make sense? That, that's kind of how I look at counseling, so that when I go back to the outside world, I'm able to show up if something tries to attach itself again or whatever. But, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I wanted to break up with her like multiple times. <laughs> His red flag was I had no close friends. Yeah. He was nervous that I was going to be that person that didn't have any friends. Yeah. And that he was going to have to be my only friend. I have to be your everything. Because yeah. I grew up, like in my community in South Bay, Florida, although it was the hood, <laughs> praise God, um, <laughs> I, um, I had some really healthy communities that, um, like I was growing up and I had really close like guy friends, um, spiritual, you know, mentors or whatever. Um, and so I always had a value for that. And I just wasn't sure if she did because I, I wasn't perfect by any means. Most of my crap came up in our marriage. I thought I was awesome when we were dating. Um, and so there you have it. But, um, <laughs> But one of the values that I've always had was having someone speak into our lives. Um, people that we wouldn't agree with. I think so many times, um, there's two, two things and I'll let you finish through. There's so many times um, we look at, you know, whether it's a mentor or someone um, that's gonna speak into your life, like they either have to look like you or they have to get you completely. And it's just not true. I think a lot of times in the, in the um, name of self-protection, we say, oh, you got to check off all the boxes before I let you speak into my life. Wow. And we, dis we disregard people that actually could have a lot to give us. Yeah. Th this, is, this is done so often where, man, I have no mothers or fathers in my life. I have, I have no one that I can go to. I, I would challenge you to look again because you have the power to show up to your life. Yeah, that, that is, um, that's my um, pivot. I don't know if you guys know basketball, but pivot, like the, the anchor that I move around. I have certain anchors that I'm like, I'm not gonna lower um, the truth to my experience. Yeah. Like, man, I, I, haven't, I haven't experienced this yet, but I trust that this is the yeah. thing. This is our faith. <laughs> this, this is faith yeah. in Jesus. Like, yeah. I, I think he's real, yeah. you know? <laughs> I've even seen healings, but I think he's real. <laughs> okay, well, 
when we die, we're going to actually find out. And there's a reason people, people are atheists out there. Because we're all thinking different thoughts. <laughs> and so for me to actually believe, like, oh man, I, like where I am, and if I open up, like I'm actually going to experience grief. But anyways, I don't remember your question. Um, it was red flags and dating. Red flags, red and flags and dating. That we wanted yes. to pick each other. Yes. Um, for me, I looked at it a very practical standpoint. I had a lot of unhealthy relationships before him that were all based on my emotions yeah. and how that person made me feel and what that person gave me. And so, when I was deciding, when I got healthy on on my own, apart outside of a relationship, I used my frontal lobe and not my emotions and my heart necessarily to make my final decision of I remember being at home at Christmas in between second year or after second year and I was thinking if I were to actually date somebody what because he was pursuing me for five months and I kept saying no because I'm like I'm not going to get caught up in a swirl again of my I need to figure out me first it wasn't even a pursuit it felt felt like you just were a hard no and I was like no you, you're the you will date me yes <laughs> yes so I had to shut it down before Christmas and just take a look at myself of if if I were to actually pick somebody who would it be and I would I remember thinking like I want somebody who already has older people in their life like speaking into their life which he had I was like, he has good friends. He actually has solid guy friends that he, all the boys I dated, they didn't have guy friends. They just, I was their everything. And so him, he had people speaking into his life. He had friends around him. People said good things about him. Older people, not just like his bros, but like mothers and fathers in this community were like, man, Doc is a great person. And there was one more thing. Oh, you were willing to grow. and get better and go after things. And I remember those four things were, it was a very unemotional decision for me because my emotions at that time weren't trustworthy. I had to build that back up in myself. But, so I went at it from that perspective of, okay, if I were to actually look, like bird's eye view my life, apart from what my emotions are saying, apart from what my body is feeling when I look at him, what, and when I stand at a bird's eye view and look at the trajectory of my life, do I see him there? steps down the road um i wouldn't say you necessarily had red flags um because i i feel like um melissa casey would, wouldn't have let you date if you had red flags i don't know if you guys know melissa casey but she was a, a pastor in this environment um and she was chantel's like mentor or whatever um and we were dating during that season but yeah, I don't think that there were red flags. Um, the fact that I didn't have friends was a bit of a... Yeah, that was probably the biggest. That was probably the biggest. Um, that, yeah, that, that was a red flag for me. That was a green flag. <laughs> that wasn't a red flag for me. That was just a flag that I wanted to look at to see if that was going to affect yeah. and that, and, my life. And that flag didn't show up until marriage either because... I was, I was trying to pretend like, man, I'm amazing, and six years don't mean anything. Six years is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's a lot of life experience. Yeah. I'm 19 freaking years old. Like, just moved I, out of his mama's house. Just moved out of my mama's house. I know how to work. That, that's all. I, like, I knew I knew how to work. Like, I knew I knew how to, like, work for a job. I knew how to stick something through. Like, and then that's about it. And then I'm like, really good at spoken order, and people love me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you quoted that, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young, scripture to me. Yeah. Which is... Yeah. <laughs> but that was my anchor. She said, red flag. <laughs> Listen, I had a value for the word of God. Um, he was very he was spiritual and mature, essentially, but there was just some other maturity things he grew in. in good marriage. Lord, yeah. Yeah. But those weren't red flags. That was just like you had to um, pick what you're gonna choose to have to deal with. I guess <laughs> people aren't perfect. Yeah. Like I think I think our fantasy idea of entering into a relationship is like you are absolutely perfect, and I am working on it. <laughs> Especially coming from the 
Kiss Dating Goodbye Make Your List culture, which is you're set, you're you're automatically cutting out so many possibilities of people, and this goes for friendships too. Like we just want to be friends with people who look like us, and so we make our list either of people that a, a husband that looks like us or of something that we don't actually have in and of ourselves that we want to get from somebody else. That's usually what our lists are. It's somebody that looks like me and an area that I struggle in or I don't like that somebody else has you that I don't. Me. Yes. Yeah. Which I would say I I had to throw my list away, but when I went back to look at it years later, you were so many of those things on that list, but not because I went searching for that yeah. those things. Yeah. Including black. Including black. It's so weird that you had that on there. <laughs> that's, that's weird. That's so cute. That, that's weird though. Yeah, and and wears nice yeah. shoes yeah. and can dance. Yeah. But because I didn't know how to dance, so I wanted someone to know how to dance. Yeah. Yeah, I can dance. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next question. Okay, yeah. Um, Richard. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Luna, um, how did, was the age difference for both of you affect, like, you leading the relationship? We actually had a conversation with that yeah. in the car outside your house one time. Because I was like, you don't remember this conversation. And I don't fully remember it right now either, but it was a good one. Where I asked you... What will it look like for uh, you as a 19-year-old to cover that. me? I remember that. In, in okay, no, a relationship. I don't remember what I said, but I remember that question. Because I, I'm like, I was 24? 20 25. Something. Yeah, 25. I was 25, you were 19. It's crazy. Um, I, and I remember we were talking on the phone before we had even started dating. I was like, I'm going to want kids. I don't know if we should have been talking about this. But I, I just laid it all out because I was like, this is what this is what you would be getting, and I don't think you actually know that you're up to the challenge. Like, I'm six years older than you. I have lived a lot more life than you. I'm gonna want to settle down quicker than you, probably, because I'm like, your your young years are gonna be, like even yesterday you had a moment when you could share, but you, like you're, those young years of being a single 19 year old, 20 year old oh, yeah. guy, yeah. you're not gonna have those if you choose me, because yeah. I'm gonna want yeah. Stability and yes. So yeah. I, I thought I knew the reality that I was stepping into. I didn't. And we found that out pretty quickly when we got pregnant four months into marriage, and, and you were 21. And I'm crying on the bathroom floor like my dreams are being stolen. Yeah. <laughs> like, actually, True story. <laughs> and this was the moment where we said, "Babe, I'm about to take that pregnancy test. I'm gonna be down. You better be up. <laughs> be not up." No, no, that was it. That was it. And um, oh. I'm so glad we got pregnant, because now when I'm 40, I'm going to be getting buckets on my child's head. I'm so. going to be laying on the couch, because I'm six years older, and he can chase after them. <laughs> um, what were we saying? Uh, how did the age difference affect? Effect. Yes. Um, I think it was just life experience. Like, she had, um, you've just gone through a lot more life. Um, I have a lot of people who actually ask me this question. Um, it, can, it it works. I mean, look at us. But like, at, at the same time, like you say that, but you were the nineteen year old kid. That's true. That's true. I, people ask me this a lot, and I'm like, there's certain th you have to know outside of their age why you're choosing them. You can't be like, oh, they're gonna eventually grow up. Like, right. they're eventually gonna figure it out. And it the age gap definitely created some codependent cycles in us because. You didn't know how to wake up without me waking right. you up. And right. I was I was feeding those things that you yeah. didn't figure out in younger years that I had figured out because I'm six years older, yeah. I had gone to college, I had figured out different habits like that. Yeah. Um, and so I always say that there's just a different level of maturity and not in like, oh, he's such an immature, but maturity, when you mature, you learn different habits and practices and just, different things that you don't necessarily yep. when you're younger. Felt like I was playing catch up. Yes, I do remember you saying that a lot. Felt like I was playing catch up. Um, but once I started having compassion on myself, I'm like, she chose me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Being secure in that reality, like, oh, you, you chose me. And, I am, and I'm not using that as a defense against you. Yeah. But I'm saying that because, oh, I am chosen and I get to show up to my life right now where I am. Yeah. 
And I think um, one of the anchors for me was, this is our story. Yeah. Like, what, what am I comparing it to? Yeah. Like being six years, what, who, what two people am I comparing that to? Because that's the question. A first grader and a seventh grader. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, Jim and, Jim and Joanna, who are, you know, the same age. And 23, yeah, they're two days apart, and oh my God. That, that's one story. That's one story. And I think when we can step outside of the, oh, she's six years older than you, what are you comparing that to? And there, around this time, there were a lot of people that were dating younger boys. And I, I took it as like, well, they're dating it. My whole family are Pumas. All, my, all the women are Pumas. Yeah, that's kind of funny. We're all married kind of funny. to younger men. Yeah, but I, I think we're the biggest gap. Yeah, we are the biggest yeah, gap. Yeah, yeah. But I would say I'm probably the furthest along, though. <laughs> Anyways, um, all right, more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a man, in the relationship, understanding the age uh, gap, did you, did you have, at any point feel your ego being bruised? Mm. And how did you deal with that? Or how did you cope with that? Because the man, you know. Yeah, you want to lead. You're made, you're made to lead. You're made <laughs> in that way. Um, I don't think I ever really um, outwardly struggled because I, I appear confident because of or my personality, but I get afraid a lot. <laughs> and I think with, with our relationship, I think I um, more so imagined that I was doing better than I was, instead of just being okay with where I, where I was at, and knowing that, oh, I'm actually growing in certain areas, I'm, I'm learning how to lead. Like, the manhood, you don't just fall into it. <clears throat> Um, and this is good for us ladies in here to, to hear as well, because I think a lot of times at, as a woman, you, you have this ex, um, expectation of my knight in shining armor, the man after my heart and, and manhood. It's going to be important that even as you, you date, like, you know, like, oh, what, what was your relationship like with your dad? Yeah. And that's not to disregard somebody. That's not to like say, all right, not dating you because you had a like. My biological dad is in prison, and my stepdad was not present at all and drank through my whole. So, like, I didn't have a great father in my house that actually showed me how to do manhood. But manhood is something that is actually imparted. Yeah. It's by rubbing shoulders with other men. We were we were made that way, and it's and it's not this thing of like, because um, I, I know like right now there's a lot. Of, a lot of stuff about toxic masculinity and and all of these things and um, leading the the misconception of leading is that it's from the front but but leading is me laying down my life and then i earned the right to lead through how i laid down my life she gives me that space she 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 gives me the space of making decisions for our family and that's through me laying down my life. And I, I think um, laying down my life, meaning I am looking for the interests of my family and not my own. Mm -hmm. Just for like, yeah. Um, but yeah, getting, getting around other men that are doing life well. Um, we're, we're made to, to conquer. We're made to go on adventure. Um, not that women aren't. But men have this innate, man, I have to hurt something. I have to feel like I'm a hero somehow. Like, I, I need to feel like I just conquered something. And the woman is not the thing to be conquered. That's good. The, the woman is pretty much the one that's going to tell you where to go and what to conquer. <laughs> <laughs> but from a place of trust. Like, I, people... It's a part, as much as it, I trust him as the head of our home, but we're partners in everything yes. that we do. And so it's not like me submitting to him as a wife means that he calls all the shots. Yeah. It's a partnership, but there's sometimes when he, I let him make the choice and I trust that because he's the head of the household. And there's some times when it's vice versa because he's yeah. submitting his life to mine. Yeah. And so 
to think that it's just the man is here and everybody follows suit is just, it's not correct. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we're partners in everything. We're, we're co-laboring. Mm -hmm. And um, becoming really good at making decisions has been really important for me leading our house. Um, that like, at the end of the day, decisions have to be made because we're mo our life is moving and someone has to be able to take the courage because it's afraid to, um, it's terrifying to make decisions sometimes. Like, do we decide left or right? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a decision and know that we can face it, whatever the circumstance or the outlier probabilities are or whatever. Um, and so me learning to like actually make decisions consistently um, and on a practical level, like when we're like stressed out in trouble, I gotta, I got to make sure like, okay, if, if I can't make a decision right now, I need to go talk with someone to help me make a decision so that I can like actually get to a point of decision. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that answered that, but yeah. having trying to hash out stuff is connection but here's but the, i remember that being oh sorry baby i was gonna say here's the thing the thing about that though you can't just say like all right our goal is connection in this conversation right, right now because then it feels ewy and you no, don't want no it it's a, no that's a that's an actual belief right like the goal being connection is a belief does that make sense? It doesn't come out in words. You gotta, you gotta realize what your goal is through your actions. Yeah. Because connection is built through trust. We're not having this conversation so that I can just give you connection out of it. It's so that we can build trust with each other so that we can connect. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what were you gonna say? That's what I was gonna okay. say. Okay. Codependent versus independent, and how is that connected? Wait, can you say it one more time? It's not registering in my brain for right for some reason. When you, in your relationship, transition from being codependent into like interdependent and getting more healthy, you said that that is connected. Or when you're codependent, you would put stuff on a shelf. So how did that change, and like how is that connected? That makes sense. Yeah, I think. Yeah. You, I, I want to try to. Yeah, you will. Okay. Um, <laughs> My, my mind just went blank, you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, that stuff on the, sh we put that stuff on the shelf because we didn't have tools to bring it down and actually work through it. It was all of, it was, it's going, we were, we were in cycles and when we didn't know how to break out of the cycle, we would just put it on the shelf because then it's like, then we're having the same argument, same conversation, same powerless feeling, same overwhelm, same I shut down, he leaves disconnected. Okay, we don't know how to fix that. Let's just put it on the shelf. Um, and so the codependency was in the cycles that we were creating. Of um, also, um, the codependency is um, it's it's pretty. You can identify it pretty quickly. Um, you can have codependent relationships outside of marriage with friends um it's codependency is a lack of trust in yourself and so you need somebody else to tell you 
what to do or to feel like you're good enough or to be affirmed in an area. Codependency has nothing to do really with a relationship. It's your lack of relationship with yourself. And so it's in, it came from the addictions world because the codependent was the one, the addict's wife, who was aiding and abetting their addiction. But because she didn't have a lack, she had a lack of self-respect and resolve and value and love for herself. And so she was just trying to, and it could have been and, vice versa. And another, um, it is, um, I know you said it's not about relationship, but it kind of is, um, partly as well, because with codependency, it's a lot about control. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to control how you're going to respond to me, because I know, I know what that, res like, if I say this to that, I know what I'll get from that response. Right. Instead of me saying what's honest. Which Hon comes back to you being you. Honesty, yes. Honesty will break codependency real fast. Yeah. And I always say the best way to get rid of codependency is to starve it. Because as soon as you start feeding that thing of like, oh, that person's going to get mad, then I need to, I'm not going to bring that thing up. I'm just going to keep. Or I need to rescue. Yes. Or every time I bring this up, they shut down. So I'm not going to bring it up. Right. Good. That's codependent. Mm -hmm. wow. So, oh, actually... Man, I got. I have to bring this up. Hey, when when you shut down, I brought this up three different times. I try to create a safe space for this, but now when I bring this up and you shut down, that actually makes me feel like I can't actually have this conversation that I feel like is affecting our trust. Because the reason we stay in a codependent cycle is because the outcome of us starving that thing of actually being like. This is how that made me feel. It's uncomfortable and it's pain, and that person is now all of a sudden mad at you, and we're trying to cut that, like make that thing not happen. So then we're continuing a cycle. Yeah. Or, or you don't want to face the re the p potential rejection yeah. of a person. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, that thing that you said hurt me. Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean <laughs> that that hurt you? Yeah. Um, well, how how you said it? Well, that's how I talk. It's, it's how I talk. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah, that is how you talk. You do, you do talk like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ow. <laughs> hey, actually, I, I know that's how you talk, but how you're talking, like, hurts. Yeah. And, and I spent some time thinking, I was like, is this, is this me? I tried to figure it out. But, like, when, when you said that, this is what I felt. Can you see, can you make that connect? Like, that conversation... Like having that space of vulnerable, authentic, letting you see me honest pain will break codependency. Yeah. And it starts, it only starts with one person. Yeah. It's not like, all right, we got to meet in the middle, codependent, because that's codependency. Right. <laughs> like if you do it, I'm going to do it. And this is why having that strong relationship with yourself and that empowering, I only get to control me comes into play because then when they react in whatever way they react or they get triggered or they get hurt or offended or they shut down or shut out, you tell yourself, I get to, I get to control me. This is in marriage too. Yes. Like, like we've done it where it's like, hey, like you're really triggered right now and everything you're saying is probably not the best like in this space. So I'm gonna need you to go talk to them. And we do it in a kind way. Like I'm not just gonna patronize. I know you're triggered, so I'm gonna have compassion I'm not gonna feed into that. Like, actually, right, right now, the, the way that, like, your behavior and your acting, like, I, these are the thoughts I'm thinking to myself. I'm not saying, babe, your behavior right now, <laughs> not doing that, because that's not gonna help. It's only gonna make me feel better and, and like, oh, I'm not in a codependent cycle, I'm making myself feel, no, I love you. I care about you. But babe, so, some of the things that you're saying, it doesn't feel like, um, it's that we're actually getting anywhere. You get, you get what I mean? And she's like, I hate, I hate this, but yeah, you're right. You're right. And moving from that codependent to interdependent is a lot of bringing other people in. 100%. So that we can be like, hey, maybe we need to meet with the boxes so that we can figure this thing out. Yeah. So that it's not just, okay, we're going from two codependent people, so now we have to figure out how to be interdependent with just us two. Yeah. It's having outside accountability so that we're not the only two people trying to break out of our codependence relationship. Right, right. And there's times where you tell, told me, like, hey, you need to go talk to Rory. I'm like, yeah, you're right. But or where you'll say, I'm going to text Yvonne because I think we need to yeah. get a session and figure this one out. Yeah. 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 Yes, hi, thank you.
Thank you guys. You guys are so powerful. Um, uh, so my question is going to be it's a different direction, but um, I keep just thinking about your kids. I don't know the whole time you're talking, and I just feel like the strong sense of like just legacy over you guys. And I just want to know like how as a couple, as dynamic and powerful, and just just so. Um, woke in your emotional like health, how are you like I guess passing that down to your children other than like by your actions yeah. and also having those um, moments of awareness in this culture where you know we tend to go to the people that look like us and talk like us like how have you even incorporated just like just your own individual diversity and um, bringing you know, your interracial um, beauty together and how you impart yeah. that to your children. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. yeah. I love that. I, uh, I'm going to add emotionally woke to my Instagram bio. Emotionally woke. 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 Emotionally and he was sitting on the ground and he was playing like with a stick and some rocks. Um, and he was, the way he was moving was like, he was like scooching his butt. You know, like when a dog rubs its butt on the carpet. Um, that's why I would never get a dog. Um, but it's scooching. Uh, it's probably because of my poop phobia though. Um, but um, as I was scooching across the ground and I have this thought, I wonder if he'll remember this. It's just a random thought. And then the next thought that I, uh, that I thought was, oh my God, I can't choose what he'll remember. This is terrifying. I can't choose what moment in the next 18 years that's going to be on his brain. I don't know. This is why it's so important to be present at all times. Because you don't know what moment Lil Zai is going to remember. And to, to answer your question, I think when it comes to um, moments, you know, and, and not knowing what moments are the moments, I think it's the Holy Spirit. Like, you, we're at a disadvantage not knowing which moment their brain is going to attach a memory to. And so Holy Spirit helped me to identify, not perfection. But do I know how to show up? Because I don't want to teach Zai to avoid pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we don't we don't teach it by like, hey son, stay, stay away from that. We 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 teach it by just our actions. And so and what what I, I know you said like, um, how do you like not just your actions, but kids learn who you are through what they see mm -hmm. and what they experience. Yeah. You know, it's it's not like. Because I listen to what I say, but he's four years old. So I think, um, yeah, but you want to ask? Yeah, and we're, I'm building a relationship with my kids in the same way that I am with anybody else. I'm building trust with them. I'm building connection with them. And so when I get it wrong, I, I say I got it wrong. And I teach him how to apologize. I teach him how to own his mess. Um, I teach him how to feel pain and what to do with that. And that sounds weird, but we were in Canada a couple of years ago and you know how in Reading it takes seven minutes to get anywhere? In my city that I grew up in, it takes 30 minutes, 40 minutes to get anywhere. And we were driving and Zai was crying in the back and my mom was like rummaging through the glove compartment in the sack trying to like hand him things and like shaking little things in front of him and I was like mom stop doing that he's got to learn how to sit with it and just figure it out and he's going to be okay and it gave me such this picture she's like and then she said oh wow I never did that with you guys and it gave me this picture of so often we're so pacified all the time but it started when we were little and our parents didn't know how to do with their own pain and their discomfort and so they were trying to keep us from feeling our own pain and discomfort and I want to teach my kids that yeah Pain is okay. It's but but that's because we actually know how to face pain. Right. Because you're not running away from it. You can't give away what you don't have. Right. And that's that's a terrifying reality. Yeah. It's like, uh, I want you to have this, but I haven't gone after it myself. Yeah. 
you know and that's why parenting is freaking tough yeah. but it's actually easier if i'm actually doing the work yeah. 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 because naturally man that stuff's gonna rub off on me because it's the work for us now but for our kids it's just gonna be how they do it for us it's the work because nobody taught us how to do it so it is work yeah. but people ask me on instagram some t sometimes like how do you get your because i is really emotionally aware and the other day i was i was talking to him about something, and he was like, no, no, you misunderstood what I said. And we looked at each other, and we were like, what? Yeah, you're right, we did misunderstand. Can you, can you re-explain the synopsis? But it's like, I'm teaching, he knows emotional language because we use emotional language. Yeah. And he, anytime, we have this feelings wheel on our fridge, and he started learning how to identify what he feels, but he would run, grab the wheel and point to the emoji, this is this one. I feel this one and this one. And then we would talk about it and we would process why he felt that way. And it's teaching him how to process pain yeah. and disappointment and frustration. And that emotions aren't scary. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That you're not, you're not at the mercy of your emotions. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and yeah. Um, yeah. triggers in marriage how what's your balance of like this is something from my past so that your action feels like it's bringing up yeah. your action is painful but like i have to own my side of it like mm -hmm. where's the balance within relationship of yeah. that yeah. and then also obviously in marriage everything feels like can feel so high stakes mm -hmm. when you get triggered mm -hmm. do you guys have like a catchphrase or like a like something that you're like oh that helps like recenter you in a moment that feels really like high intensity yeah that's a really good question i think because we have a lot of trust through doing the work together that we we always keep short accounts with each other yeah. and so because we would go days disconnected yeah. like days yeah. silent treatment days try to come back didn't work out and we lived in More trigger city we went to trigger yeah. mart and then left them with the Trigger toy store, <laughs> trigger everywhere. So, and a lot of it at the beginning was my triggers because I had a lot of ex-boyfriend pain that obviously when you're in marriage and you're that close to somebody, it's going to bring up all of the times when you being close to that somebody in the past, you got hurt. Um, and it can feel really messy because it just kind of starts spewing out and you don't know where it starts, where it ends, where he starts, where he ends. And so me, when I got, as soon as I found out I was pregnant with my first, we were only four months into marriage, we were met, already messy, yeah. yucky triggers coming up in me. I knew, oh, there's stuff inside of me that is going to affect this kid if I bring them. I'm, I'm codependent. I'm afraid. I'm horribly insecure. I don't trust myself. I need Dante to tell me that I'm okay all the time. And so I went and did my own work. So I went to therapy for 18 months. Yeah. I think it was apart from and, you. And when, when you did that, I just started escaping. Yeah. Yeah. So she did work and I did not. Because he thought it was all my stuff, yes. which a lot of it was circumstantially, but the interactions of, yeah. were both of us. Yes. And I think one of the ways where when a trigger comes up and you're like, okay, you triggered me, but it's also stuff from the past each individual needs to own their part yeah because i think in that space of ownership man i i did show up late and you you're used to people you know or you you have people show up late in your life and that just triggered you by me coming late well i still need to be on time like i actually still need to make sure i'm home on time and I'm not going to focus on, oh, I know this about you, and I know that this is triggered from this, and you're pissed off at me because of this thing. I'm not going to point to that because that's me actually self-protecting. Like, like, me focusing on that is me not owning this, which is me self-protecting. But instead, man, ah, babe, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on what I need to own. I'm so sorry, because I trust, I trust that you're gonna focus on what you need to own. Yeah. Right, and mine was not dipping, in, not, in, not letting power, the powerlessness I felt because of my past be my reason for reacting and 
blowing up or i'm not really a blow up kind of person i'm more of a shut down kind of person but my triggers don't are my excuse my triggers are just a red flag that is waving of hey you this is your pain and you need to deal with it not how can i just suck you in to my pain yeah yeah. and i and i own what i can own like yeah babe I, i did show up late um i'm really sorry about that um i need to do a way better job at that and I leave it there. Is there is there anything else that that you feel like you need from me with that? While knowing that she just got triggered, like I'm fully aware, but I'm not afraid of her triggers. I'm I'm not afraid of you swirling. I'm not afraid of you losing your crap because of something that I did. I am very secure in me, and I can bring my full self even when I've made a mistake because I'm not partnered with shame. I'm. This isn't me being prideful. I'm, I'm not going to give way to shame because shame causes me to retreat. Yeah. Shame says that I'm not enough, but actually I am the man for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the same on the other side of having the messy story and the h- triggering past is I had to own my story, not let it be the thing that was just allowed me to get triggered all the time. I had to actually go back in my story and realize that there was a lot of shame that I still carried because of that. And I used it to victimize myself and to give myself an excuse for being messy and emotionally whatever. So I had to go back in my story and own that so that I could actually bring that and so it wasn't messing up our story. Yeah, and um, counseling. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Counseling and us putting in the work. Yeah. Counseling, you go and they lay out, hey, here's what you can do. And it's up to you to take it up and for you to run with it. Mm -hmm. Because I want this to not just work. I want this to thrive. I I want this to be a beacon of hope for other lives and other marriages. And I want my boys to do the same, you know? Yeah. 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 I'm curious as to what your guys' relationship and block with God looks like as a couple versus like your own person. Yes, Chantel gets up at 4.45. <laughs> Makes me tired thinking about it. Um, that is not my portion in life. <laughs> um, but my portion is my sons that wake up at the crack of dawn as well. Um, Zai is a lot like Chantel. I'm like so, I'm so grateful. It might be a little codependent, but I'm so grateful that Kobe is not like either of them and he like wakes up slowly i'm like yes there's another (laughs) um so so but um yeah our um when we first started dating we we had this conversation of what do we want our relationship with god to look like together and because i would spend hours in my closet with god i was in a really deep healing season and so i would just spend hours and it was just like literally in a real closet closet, closet, on the floor yeah yeah and then so we started dating and i was actually really afraid how our relationship was going to disrupt what i had built with god and so i remember we met at coffee bar back when it was coffee bar and with our list of how we were going to bring god into our relationship and this, this is what happens when you don't really have people. Awkward. This is what happens when you don't have people speaking into your relationship. Because at, at one portion of our dating, we didn't have anybody actually. You do weird stuff. You do. And then, but we would yeah. bring lists every week on our date night of how that other person bothered us throughout the week. Yeah. But, it, but you want to know what's crazy? Down. You want to know what's crazy? When I think back to that, this is just the weirdest thing. Like we weren't like feeling bad about ourselves. We were like, man, this is amazing. Like, 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 like you're growing me, I'm growing like, you. Like if you would have put us on a panel back then, we would have been like, you need to make a list of all the Create things. Create a list that so that you guys can figure it out really quick. And uh, Melissa Casey, we told her that we were doing that, and she was like, that's weird. Don't do that. Okay, no more lists. We stopped, we stopped doing lists after that time. <laughs> Meeting with her, um, it was literally. Um, I'm pretty sure it was from the heart, but I remember where we were sitting. And she said, okay, no more lists. Y'all aren't doing that. Just show up to a date and enjoy each other. <laughs> yeah, but um, bringing God into our actual actual relationship, um, her relation, at the end of the day, when we all die, I'm gonna stand before him and she gonna stand before him. Yeah. This was actually somebody, I was in a mom's class one time and somebody asked like, how do you, how do you deal with like your husband when he, 
kind of treats your children a little bit differently. He doesn't, um, like, comes home and kind of doesn't connect with them in the way that you want them to. And I think it was Danny Silk, he said, your husband's relationship with your kids is going to be different than your relationship with your kids. And at the end of the day, they get to own their relationship and you get to own yours. And I think we think that when we come together um, as one flesh, we just have to meld our relationship. But that's another version of codependency, of like, how can we bring your relationship with God and my relationship with God and make it work in our marriage? I have my own relationship with God. My, my very own, he has his very own, and we we bring it together. Like, he shares what God is speaking to him. Yeah. I share what, it's like, I'm talking about a friend, and he's talking about a friend. Yeah. And then we're talking about that same friend, yeah. but together. We, Not like, how do we talk about God together as a married couple? And, and we prophesy over each other. Mm-hmm. We, we, we get, like, I get a vision from God for her life. Yes, like, and those, man, some of those words have marked my seasons yeah. because I, I didn't see them for myself. You're, they're always in the middle of the night. Yeah. He wakes me up at 3 a.m. giving me a prophetic word and Don't goes back to that. sleep. I and I like, type it on my phone, like, broadly, and then I press the <laughs> But I, 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 I pray for her when she sleep. I put my hands on her. I just pray for her. And I tell him to be quiet. No, there's that one time. <laughs> one time, so I'm going in. I'm pretty sure angels are in the room, the third heavens. I'm like, shaka ba And I got my hands on her, and she's like, can you be quiet? <laughs> Uh, okay, vulnerable. All right, the angel says But I love that I get I can trust his relationship with God and vice versa. We're not creating something to get, and we do. We do. Our God, God is the center of our family. We're always asking my, our son, like, what is God speaking to you? Yeah. Like, what does Jesus say about it? Sometimes that when he watches a show, I I say. The Holy Spirit tells you not to watch a show. You're not gonna watch that show, and sometimes He'll do it. Yeah, so many times um, I'm about to like make a decision or something, and I'm like, Chantel, can you like help me make this decision? She's like, I'm gonna trust whatever the Holy Spirit says to you. I don't know if you know how often you do that, but you do that so because often. God is a way better advice giver than I am, and so I can give my advice. We can, but. But I trust God in you, and so um, at the end of the day, I trust your relationship with God that you've built up outside of me. And that that shows. That shows in how we love each other. That shows in how we forgive each other. That shows how quick we are to own things. Because there's some times where I walk away and I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit, and I don't feel shame. I'm reminded of who I'm supposed to be in his family. And so, yeah. Now you're kind of growing in this independent relationship. So what was like the biggest key for you mm-hmm. in coming awake to like your own internal world and being able to bring that to your wife? Rigorous honesty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At every single moment, I've been completely honest. Mm-hmm. Not knowing what's on the other side of that. Mm-hmm. That no matter the cost, I will be completely this is how that affected me. I don't like that. Mm-hmm. I like this. But very like, mm-hmm. and being aware, oh, I wasn't honest. Dang it, I gotta go back and tell her that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about small stuff. Yeah. Like, oh babe, I pretended that I liked that because you liked it. I don't like it. Yeah. Like that, starting small, because I think sometimes we realize like, oh my God, I'm the peacemaker and everything I do. How do I take this job? <laughs> You know, when actually it's just a day in and day out, I'm going to be intentional with this moment right here. And, and that's that's where you begin to, to break down this, this this false responsibility, really. Yeah, wow. like false responsibility of what I think I should be. And I think you'll realize on the other side of being honest is that the world is waiting for your real self yeah. to show up. And yeah. And once that responsibility, that false responsibility of being a peacemaker or being the one who um, who has to be the confident one or being the one who always has to be joyful, like all of these responsibilities that we felt in our families that were adopted, mm-hmm. we begin to break those down through being our most honest selves and we realize on the other side that 
there's so much more freedom available for you to really show who you are to the world. Yeah. And not everybody's going to like that. I think a lot of times we avoid being honest because we realize, man, this person I created, people really like that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm addicted to the person that people like versus me being my true self and if people like me or not. Yeah. And, that, and that's something that you grow into. Have compassion on yourself that you were given that role when you were at an age that you didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't know what was happening to you. I didn't know I was being made the peacemaker. Like, I didn't know that, that that was where my significance started to come from as a young kid, you know? Yeah. Like, and I, I look back on that boy, and I'm like, man, oh, you did, you did your best. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh. so right now, I'm trying to live out of that. Oh, I'm just, oh, oh, Dante. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have compassion on me, even if nobody else does. Yeah. Because yeah. I deserve that. Yeah. That'll allow you to be a lot more honest. All right, we hope you guys enjoyed part two of this two part episode series. Yes. Um, we, I know we said this at the beginning, but we literally had so much fun doing that and getting to have conversations with creatives. And the room was just really hungry and really willing to learn and um hungry for information to thrive yeah just yeah. good soil for good seeds to land on yeah it was it was a lot of fun talking with them and dialogue and they had some really great questions that i was like man i i love the way that y'all are thinking about going after things and dreaming and about yourselves and so that was a lot of fun for us we hope that you got something out of hearing that conversation um, and yeah, just let us know if um, you have more questions from that. DM us right away, like I said in the beginning. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you guys for listening to Undoing the Complex. And we will see y'all next time. Bye.